Hello, or good morning from my time, or right now, but it might be any time when you see this, so I hope you're all staying safe and well. This is the second to last of these narrated lectures. And in a way, I found this really difficult, because as you must know from reading the chapter, just how much interesting stuff is going on. Um, I'd begun, I wanted, wanted to talk about Timbuktu, I'd, you know, or the, what's going on in Africa at this point. I mean, there's so much, you know, the Crusades, um, Song China, there's just so much going on. Um, but I think in this time, um, it, and so I did, again, you, you read the lecture, I put the quiz on, I tried to make sure the quiz questions inspired you to read, you know, the whole, you know, the, um, the whole chapter, so you're getting a good sense of what's going on. I think, for me, the best thing to do that's different than just obviously repeating the readings to you is trying to get you to take a different view of the readings or or kind of help you kind of think in broader terms. So I've chosen one particular thing to um, focus on today, and that's the Mongol Empire. And we're going to actually focus on it from, I, I, uh, I we're starting off with this poem that you're seeing on your screen right now. It's a poem, it's from a, it's a, it's from a musical called Wicked. Some of you may have seen this. Um, and it's basically telling history from a, it's not real history, it's, a, it's the, you know, the, the, um, the Wizard of Oz, and looking at it from the perspective of Elphaba. But all through this, there's just an idea that they have a lot about, actually, sort of history, how you tell history in there, because they're actually, you know, trying to say, oh, look, we think we know this history, but it's actually different. Now, this particular song is from a, um, a scene where the wizard, who is evil in this, um, in this, um, in this version, in Elphaba, who's who's actually a very positive character in this, um, he's try he's actually um, she's actually discovered he's a fraud, and he's trying to convince her to come back to her, her side. And and what he says that's not true that I don't want to support before this, is if you've listened to the whole song, he says, well, you know, he says, she, she accuses him of being like lying to people. She says, well, you know, we believe all sorts of things that aren't true where I come from, which is obviously coming back from you know our world. Um, and we call it history. Now, history, I want to be really clear, is not lies. Um, history, historians work very hard to try and try and like and debate among themselves and be really clear about like what's true and what's not true. So to say something, to teach something, especially in a historical textbook, it's gone through many, many, um, many, many, um, basically layers of people checking it out and making sure it's true. Um, that, or, or sorry, like fact, you know, factually true, but perspectives on history may differ. And what, it's not so much that everything is a lie, but people, you know, and, and, and again, I want to focus that there is truth, and I'm not saying that there's no real truth, there is definitely truth, there is things are provable, you know, you can, you know, people can argue about it, but there are in the end facts, and facts do matter, I want to be clear about that. Um, but how we see historical figures depends very much on the political context. It doesn't mean that nothing's true, but it's an important thing to be aware of. Certainly if you're going to teach history, but even if you're just as a citizen. So I thought this would be a really good way to, to step away from everything, um, to, to step, step back for a minute and think about how we perceive you know, um, different historical figures. And the Mongols are a figure that's famous, and they're famous, but... People generally, the general knowledge about them is only partial. So, and so I thought this would be an interesting thing. So this is, I, again, I don't, I don't agree with the idea that you know we teach all sorts of things, we teach all sorts of lies and call it history. That's not true. But this is actually quite interesting. It says a man's called a traitor or liberator, a rich man's a thief or philanthropist. And again, you can hear this sung much better if you listen to the um, the, the the song on Moodle. Is one a crusader or ruthless invader? And that's probably the most important line from our perspective. Like, how, you know, crusader being a positive force c coming in, or are, are they ruthlessly invading? And, of course, you read about the crusaders this week as well. And this is something, it's all in what label is able to persist. And that's, we're going to see this as I talk about the, the, um, the Mongol Empire. And this, especially those of you who are going to teach history, are really going to see this. But again, those of you just who are going to be just citizens in the world as well, you know, just, I mean, basically all of you are going to understand this. There, there are precious few of these with moral ambiguities, and so we pretend they don't exist. Um, and that's and that's true as well. If you're teaching history, you'll see just how few are these with moral ambiguities when you get called, when you try to teach history in a more complex way, and you get calls from the parents, which is luckily something I don't have to deal with as a, as a college professor. Um, but this is just about, like, how... 
how we, you know, how we view historical figures. And we're going to actually use the, use the specific example of the Mongols. So I said potential, oh, I, I said midterm, which is actually wrong here. I don't, I'm sorry, I should have changed this. This is the final, it's not potential, this is one of your final questions. What were the successes of the Mongol Empire? Why was it so short-lived despite these successes? And what does the history of the Mongol Empire tell us about historical memory? Some of you, this might be a little bit familiar to some of you because I do, because this is this is the one time that crosses over with my modern global history class. Um, but it's worth looking at again in a more focused way, especially since this class is going to be more focused on certain themes. I thought this would be a good theme to look at. Genghis Khan and Mongol empires. So... Basically, I'm going to rely on you to have done the reading for you know, most of the, the um, all the details of the Mongol Empire. But the big thing to look at, if you see this map here, is just how huge the Mongol Empire was. It's like, amazing. I mean, the biggest empire the world had ever seen um, before. And there's actually not one political unit that that um, that encompasses all this now. You look at China, you look at Korea, you know, Tibet, and then you go all the way to the Middle East, the modern Middle East. When you look at Persia, that's actually Iran. Baghdad would be Iraq, Aleppo would be Syria now if you're looking through, through that. Then go upward with modern day Russia, it goes to Moscow, Kiev. And then it stopped basically in Western Europe. The Mongols weren't able to conquer Western Europe. But if you're looking at this huge, huge, um, huge empire, you're looking at you know, um, East, you know, East Asia, um, not South Asia, they don't conquer India. Um, but you know, certainly through you know, certainly through Tibet, Mongolia, and Eastern Europe, and the Middle East, it's huge. Now, there's a lot of infighting, as you read um, during this time. It's not one emperor that did this all. Different of the different of the um, the powerful Mongols, the descendants of Genghis Khan, can, um, did um, you know could control different parts of this, and it was run in fairly different ways. But it was all connected, and so the world, and this is the really big takeaway here, the world was connected in ways that it never had been before. Now, at the end of the lecture, and we're going to follow this next week as well, that's the other reason why I'm putting this here. Um, when, we look, when, when we look next week, as well, when we look next week, we're going to see one of the results of the connection was, and unfortunately this is, has a more, con more contemporary ring than I had expected when I started the semester, um, you know, the disease, you know, the, the, um, the falling of the plague. So we know a little bit more about disease spreading now than I would have liked us to, um, liked us to have personally experienced. Um, but this is what you really want to think about as connections. You know, your textbook is called Worlds Together, Worlds Apart. So when you look at this map, you see these connections, right? You're seeing unprecedented connections. You're starting to see, you had the Silk Road before, you had some connections, but now, say, when you look at China on one part of the, and then when you look at the opposite end, Moscow, you're seeing these kind of connections in Persia, and again, Baghdad, you're seeing these connections. It's all part of one, one kind of political unit, even though they did not all have the same ruler. Now, I want to start with a figure that you might be familiar, you might have heard Genghis Khan, and Chinggis is the other way you'd say it. Um, this is obviously, it's a, um, in, you know, it, it's, you know, he didn't use the, you know, our modern alphabet as well, so we're approximating his name. But Genghis Khan is famous, and I say, I kind of do this when I'm, when I'm looking at, when I you know, have everybody here, I say, what kind of dinner guest is Genghis Khan? Um, and it's, kind of, people kind of laugh, and, and I ask, and, and basically, I think, what's, what's your view of Genghis Khan, is what I mean. And people always say, those who refer to him as a sort of barbarian. He's, he's sort of a barbarian. He's sort of a frightening person who kind of comes in. And when you think of a kind of dinner guest, he'd be somebody who you would think would, if he came in, he would just like, you know, smash all your china and, and, and you know, destroy everything. Um, the Mongols are seen historically as very destructive figures, as barbaric figures. Um, and so when somebody compares somebody, hey, he's a real Genghis Khan, you wouldn't think, oh, let's have him over to dinner. You would think, well, this is someone uh, that's frightening or that I want to avoid, right? That's how he's gone down in history. That's how he's been remembered. But let me show you something else. And this is a really interesting historical um, source. This is a commissioned portrait of Genghis Khan. Now, commissioned portraits are very interesting because what commissioned portraits do is they show you how somebody wants to be seen, right? They don't like, 
when so a commissioned portrait is a portrait that that the person themselves says, "Okay, paint me." And obviously, this is a really powerful person, um, you know, Genghis Khan. So he's going to get painted the way he wants to be painted. And look at this. This is someone who does not look like. If I showed you this and said twenty guesses, I don't think anybody would be able to figure out that this is supposed to be Genghis Khan because it looks so different than our image of him. He looks more like wise and sage-like, right? And this is, in fact, how he wanted to be remembered. He wanted to be remembered as a wise, good ruler, a kind of Chinese sage. Remember that they, the Mongols did begin, as he's in the reading, in Mongolia, which is um, the, the Chinese would consider, would consider them uh, Bavarians. They considered everybody who wasn't Chinese Bavarians, to be honest, but like they considered them in particular um, the kind of the steep people, the nomads. Um, we've talked before about the importance of nomads and settled people, right? So these are these kind of the nomadic people and the settled people and how they were mutually dependent on each other. But the settled people tended to re re um, regard them as barbarians. But Genghis Khan also, was, as he became more familiar w with, um, with Chinese culture, had actually a deep admiration of Chinese culture as well. And he, when he had his portrait painted, he, you, you can see that he was very influenced by this. And he wanted to be remembered again as a, as, 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 as a calm, sage-like ruler. And if the Mongol Empire had persisted longer, um, if it had been a longer empire, this is maybe how he would have been able to, this is how he might have been remembered. But in fact, that, that's not how he's remembered at all. We'll talk about exactly why this is. This is the other very well-known figure. Um, and you read in your text about his other sons. Um, but Kublai Khan, um, from 1215 to 1294 was the ruler of China. He was met by um, Marco Polo, and so he was immortalized in Marco Polo's writing in Europe. He was also met by Ibn Battuta, um, who you would have read about it. I, I tried to direct your reading to do these two, both these two great travelers as well with a, with a quiz question there. Um, the, a very famous poem by Samuel, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge about Kublai Khan. Um, his, you know, the wonders of Hangzhou became very famous in Europe. Um, if you've heard the term Xanadu, that was also, it came from here as well. Same, I it was made famous through this, um, through this poem. So he was very well remembered. He's remembered somewhat more positive, not quite as negatively as his father, Genghis Khan, because of the fact that he was ruling such a magnificent city um, during, um, during, this, during, during this period. Um, and so this is one picture of him. This is another portrait of him, a more thoughtful pose of Kublai Khan. Again, how they wanted to be remembered as the, as the Mongols. But even though Kublai Khan and his, the fantastic city of Hangzhou, which I'll talk about more momentarily, is not remembered and quite, he doesn't quite evoke the same ideas of violence as Kublai Khan, um, I'm not Kublai Khan, as, um, as Genghis Khan, certainly the Mongols themselves have been seen as brutal rulers. And this idea that Kublai Khan and this great city of Hangzhou are kind of separated from that in the popular imagination. So, now I gave you again, two of the quiz questions were sort of, um, were not sort of, they were meant to draw your attention to this. I, I wanted to, you to read, I didn't have all the, you know, I only had two, the, the other 13 were obviously about other things um, in, the, um, in the reading. But two of them were, and one of the things I was kind of interested in you looking at is the Mongols in Hangzhou. Um, the Mongols came and they did not destroy Hangzhou. They have a huge um, reputation for destroying, but they tended to be strategic. Um, and Hangzhou, especially since they themselves had always you know, looked at Chinese wealth, they really wanted to take Hangzhou and not destroy it. And a lot of their earlier destruction was almost this idea of trying to um, a modern term might be shock and awe, trying to frighten everybody around them into accepting as inevitable because they actually wanted, they wanted to be able to take these possessions. They wanted to be able to take these cities and rule them. They wanted to be able to get the wealth from the cities. They didn't want to destroy Hangzhou. So Hangzhou, as they said, survived intact and, and, um, and, and it remained one of the greatest cities in the world. It was at the time the, the greatest cities, one of the greatest cities of the world, probably the greatest city of the world. Like people, travelers like Ibn Battuta from other places and then Marco Polo from Europe had never seen you know, anything like it before. Now the Mongols in the Middle East, this is where you get the reputation for brutality more. Um, and I think that your textbook described it well. It was, they, they were, you know, the, and that was, it was later than in Hangzhou, it was absolutely horrific. Um, you know, one of the descriptions that might have stood out to you in your, um, in the text was 
the other um like right you know like like, like drag dragging rule you know dragging whereas again when you look at Hangzhou the emperor and Chinese emperor were treated with respect when you look at the Middle East um taking the political and religious rulers and in one particular case wrapping wrapping them in carpet and basically dragging them until they were um, dead and, and, and killed and just and that's just one particular thing but just the, the bloodshed in there so there was it wasn't I want to be clear here it was not that oh the Mongols just got a bad rap and there were actually these really nice guys who came in no the, the Mongols had a well-deserved reputation for brutality but that's not all they were that's not all they were and there are other leaders who um, exercise great brutality in their conquering who are not perceived in the same uh, way of just being this this kind of out of control um, violence as well so we're going to talk about that as well when we look at this so the question is like what about mongol successes what were mongol successes and you see here um they had obviously one of the largest empires the sheer territory that they controlled was an amazing success and these other, you know, at, at the time. But that's something that people know. Um, one of these other things I'm going to talk about that people don't think about as much, because a lot of times, again, they come down to our historical memory as almost only always barbarians. One really interesting thing about them is that they avoided the religious conflict that plagued Europe. Um, there was brutality toward Muslims in when they conquered the Middle East, but it wasn't because they were Muslim. They weren't trying to change their religion. And um, when you look at... Europe, Western Europe, for hundreds of years, you see these religious wars. Um, and this is something that the, the Mongols avoided. They actually didn't fight over religion. And, and they actually, even among themselves, some of them were Buddhist, and some of them actually did convert to Islam to, when they were ruling Muslim territories. Um, some of them were Christian, historian Christian, which is a different um, a different version of Christianity. Um, as, 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 your, as your text says, but they have, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of the, um, a lot of different religions, and that really fits into this broader flexibility in rule. Again, some of the conquering was absolutely brutal, and I don't want to, again, ever, you know, again, pretend that the Mongols were just these actually, you know, nice, you know, nice, you know, nice, kind conquerors that they weren't. But once they ruled, they actually, again, they were pragmatic, they were fairly pragmatic, and they wanted, they didn't want to have continual bloodshed in their territory. So, Oh, they had a lot of flexibility in rule. Um, once a, a territory was conquered, they let the conquered territories keep m m uh, many of their own traditions. In China, um, people they, they actually discontinued the civil service exam, and that was something that was very traumatic for Chinese scholars. That's why Chinese scholars have given them such a, a bad rap. And then it was recontinued in the Ming. Some of you might have written about the, the um, that for your um, response papers last week. Um, so the civil service exam was just briefly discontinued among, well, not briefly, I mean, for a couple hundred years uh, among the Mongol dynasty, but then it was or about a hundred years, but then it was re, it was quickly um, reinstated when the Ming dynasty took over. So they themselves had come from a non-literate tradition, but especially the rulers learned to read. Um, Kublai Khan's mother, in fact, you know, made, kind of made she was not non-literate, but she made sure her children were literate. So they're starting to, and, and they actually made use of engineers and officials in the society that they conquered, especially if people went over to them fairly early. Um, they were able to, and were willing to work with them. They actually rewarded them well. Um, another thing that you see here is the more freedom for women in Mongol society. Um, Mongol, they didn't have complete freedom of marriage, especially if they were from more elite families. That's how they uh, basically it was through marriage is how they cemented. Um, is how they cemented alliances both in tribes and then later on when you when you look at their dealings with the Chinese but women could divorce and women could own property um, in, in their own names and those were things that you know freedoms that women did not have in Europe or China at the time things where people were considered more civilized quote unquote civilized um, the most important I'm going to talk about this momentarily they had the most extensive trade systems the world had ever known I'm going to talk about that um, momentarily because that's I think the things that you find most surprising and this kind of gives an interesting question. What counts as civilized? Who gets to decide what's civilized and what's uncivilized? Generally speaking, um, the people who write the history are people in sedentary societies. That means agricultural societies, like societies that are more, more similar to ours, where sedentary means you basically stay in one place. 
And they've tended to see people like the Mongols as barbarians in their society. And they would have even seen the idea of women being able to own property. That would have been seen at the time in European and Chinese societies as, as, as kind of part of their barbar barbarism. But now we would see that as progress. So it depends on you know, kind of how you view, again, your particular view. And again, who writes history? Well, the Mongols didn't write, they actually commissioned some histories to be written, but most of the histories were written by people and more sedentary people, people that they had conquered. So this is something that's really amazing, um, the Mongols and trade. And as I said, the Mongols made the world a much smaller place. They fostered connections. And they didn't just do this through brute conquering after the conquering. And again, this is something that when we think of Genghis Khan as this crazy person, we don't always think about what the Mongol Empire did, but they fostered commercial and cultural exchanges alike that had never been seen before. Now, I always ask my classes at this point in this lecture, what do you think, when you look at the trade, trade routes and merchants, if you were a merchant during this time, what's your biggest problem? And the answer, of course, I'll just give it to you, is people stealing your stuff, right? Because you, you're, you're carrying these incredible valuable things. And your again, your biggest problem is like the, the temptation is people going to you know going to set upon you and take your stuff, right? And so a big expense of merchants is obviously protection. Now, what the merch, what the Mongols did, is they protected trade routes, so they made trade a lot safer. Um, and so being a merchant during this time became much more lucrative and much safer. And one of the big things is when you go to sleep, what happens when you go to sleep, right? Because nobody can stay away. These are long journeys that take weeks or months, usually often months at the time, and you can't stay awake for months. So when you sleep, how do you make sure people aren't going to take your stuff? Well, usually merchants traveled in groups too um, at this time, it wouldn't you know? But still, one of the big things they did is establish new secure way stations. So these were places that people could stop and they were safe. They could know that their stuff would be relatively safe. They were very, very, they used a lot of their military strength and military know-how in making and actually protecting people as well and making sure that trade worked well. They wanted, again, to have a wealthy and powerful empire, which they did for a while. They established shared credit systems and accounting techniques. Um, you might have read, in the, hopefully you read in, this, in the Song Dynasty about the, the, idea, the issue of the cash. You know, they, they were developing more of a idea of um, not, not, ju not just um, doing money, but actually kind of credit systems were developed at this time. And they actually, the Mongols developed them as they never had before, so carried trade credits and accounting techniques. So people didn't have to carry, and if you're a merchant, you're going to like this even, even with this more secure way, you don't have to carry all your money, all your gold on you. And this was amazing. So you had trade like you'd never seen before. This is probably one of the biggest things that you see with the, um, the Mongol dynasty that's just not seen in the popular image of them. Um, is you don't see them as people developing these amazing new accounting systems. You don't see them as people who are really fostering trade, but this is what they did. And this here we see is the biggest irony. Now we're going to talk more about the Black Death next week. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste of it um, this week. Now ironically, just so you know, I actually decided we were going to focus on the Black Death. Um, my original decision to focus on the Black Death actually came way before this pandemic when I was deciding what I was going to do about the course in December or very early in January. So this is again a kind of another kind of irony. But the irony as far as the Mongols go is that their biggest triumph, the, the, their, their biggest success establishing this amazing trade system has largely been law, uh, forgotten by the world and that is in part because of their relatively short, you know, the, the, their base the Mongol Empire only lasted 100 years, which is not again a very long time to um, for you know for, uh, for considering the size of the empire it crumbled pretty quickly. Your Texas they were better at conquering than ruling, and that was part of it. But one of the things that really brought their um, brought their empire down was the Black Death, a and their best, their biggest, their um their 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 biggest um, triumph, their biggest success was the trade routes, and that ironically brought the Black Death, which. In some accounts, were the, was the thing. It's hard to say. Like, would they have been able to survive longer without the Black Death? But they certainly wouldn't have crumbled with the speed they did. Um, so they would have survived somewhat longer. Like, would they have survived hundreds of years? It's hard to say. Um, but the Black Death certainly was was very very important in destroying um, the Mongol Empire. 
So there were several reasons for the ultimate failure of the Mongol Empire. One reason was that they had difficulty running more literate and technologically advanced societies. Um, they actually, they, they, now again, it's hard to say whether they would have been able, because at, at the time, again, it was a relatively, but the, you know, the, the Mongols were becoming more literate themselves. They were understanding these things, but they actually had to rely on what they called collaborators, um, what we call collaborators, like people who were willing to work with them in this. And that, that fact made it more difficult for them to be accepted also as, as legitimate rulers. The violence they used in conquering a lot of the population, you write about the horrific violence in the Middle East, they didn't use it everywhere. For example, in Hangzhou, they treated the emperor, you know, the, um, the, the emperor and emperors and his family with you know, relative, um, you know, with, with, with respect as honored guests, as, as your text says. Um, but they also used horrible violence in, 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 con in a lot of conquering, and that alienated the population for many, for a number of generations. Again, if it had been hundred, if it had been longer than a hundred years, that's you know, would would this have been forgotten because they were able to control history, you know, writing their own history, maybe. But remember, they weren't literate themselves; they weren't able to completely control the perception of them. They weren't able to control how they were written about. Um, and certainly after the Black Death, they weren't able to control this at all. So they they weren't in power long enough to be able to kind of make up or have people forget the brutality of, 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 of a lot of their conquering. They weren't as good. Again, the difference between conquering and ruling. Conquering brute force is okay. We've talked before about this idea of hard power and soft power. Um, you can conquer with hard power, but to, to stay in power for a long time, um, soft power, being able to please, basically make the, um, make the people you're ruling feel like you're their legitimate ruler again requires a lot of soft power and the mongols weren't able to capture that although again you can argue looking at some mongol societies that they were learning that but all this would have come to an end because of the um because of what they call the black death or the bubonic plague um so that was the biggest way that completely like le um, led to the destruction of society so we're gonna talk more next week um but if you look through here so the light so the light red ones you can look and see it says right there the light red lines are the trade routes you can see all the all the trade routes again that's one of the biggest things in the mongol empire was their trading um and then the big thick red lines are the progress of the bubonic plague which people think developed in Western China or sort of the Tibetan plains, the the um the Yunnan, um, basically the the um kind of Yunnan as well. Not again in in China proper as much as sort of the Western fringes of there. Again, at the place it was developed, it wasn't as as harmful, but it became much more destructive. And you can see it just following. You can see it basically following these trade routes. I'm going to give you more detail on this next week. Um, but you can just look and see and how it went into Western Europe as well, um, how it how it basically decimated the Middle East. It did not, if you look at India, the Delhi Sultanate at the time, um, some, some regions were spared, um, not being part, but every part, every region that was part of the trade routes um, were decimated. Um, Western Europe was not part of the Mongol Empire, but it was decimated as well. We're going to talk about why that was next week. So, it went on Mongol trade routes, devastating to Asia and Europe. Death rates of 25% to 50%. The European population was reduced by one third. The Chinese population from about 120 million to 80 million, and all the Mongol governments fell. It was something that was, um, they, they just, among this, this amazing destruction, they, they were relatively new governments, they hadn't had the heart, you know, the, again, they didn't really have the hearts and minds of the people. People remembered the violence, so they never had the kind of legitimacy, even a very, a government that did have much more legitimacy was likely to fall at this point, because they basically couldn't control, I mean, they couldn't control the um, population in this, in this sense of this amazing, you know, dest um, destruction. But again, the irony here is that the thing that we would look at now and say, well, this is the most quote-unquote civilized, this is the most, again, um, kind of spectacular accomplishment, 
is developing these new trade routes, which brought the world together as never before, ironically ended up something that they couldn't have controlled, that nobody could have controlled, was the um, the uh, the, uh, the unleashing of the um, the unleashing of the bubonic plague on unsuspecting popula um, populations, populations that weren't ready. A new virus again. We're seeing this now, unfortunately, a new virus going through until people are used to it or develop there's immunity in the population can just go um, can go through and be very very destructive and the bubonic plague and I'm not totally comparing this pandemic to the bubonic plague because the bubonic plague was much much more destructive um, it had much much higher death rate um, than this current virus but we're seeing even the impact of this current this you know this current virus which is not nearly as devastating on this although if you're in Unfortunately, I have to say that if you're listening to this from New York City, you may actually have a very different perspective on how destructive this virus uh, virus is. So, back to this idea of historical memory. What does this tell us about historical memory? And I'm going to go back again, slide again, back again to this. Um, this puts a song, but also kind of a poem that did this. And the third one is one a crusader and ruthless invader. It's all in what label is able to persist. So the Mongols, as you saw from their commissioned portraits, wanted to be seen as wise, sage-like rulers. And, but they were never again able to, you know, they were never able to overcome their perception of barbarian, of being barbarians, even with all their accomplishments with the empire and with these very sophisticated trade routes. They were never able to do this. So the label that persisted about them was them as being horrible barbarians. Again, Genghis Khan is just someone who'd come in and destroy everything. But that was not quite true. So looking at these last three lines again, pressure, there are precious few of with moral ambiguities, and so we pretend they don't exist. You know, the Mongols, and again, taking, there, there's a tendency to want people to be either, I, I think um, growing up watching Disney movies for a lot of people, you know, either heroes or villains. And the Mongols were much more complicated than that. Um, you should never overlook the violence that they did, but they weren't only violent, violent invaders. And a lot of the perceptions of them, even though their violence was very real, of them were, were the prejudice of sedentary societies against, um, you know, um, basically against um, um, nomadic peoples, you know, as, as they were. And so just again, to go back again, some of the things that we would have seen that we would look back and say, okay, this was, you know, this was horrible and, um, or, or things that we would see now as progressive, like women owning property, women being able to divorce, women having more freedom and independence, they would have seen as part of their barbarism. So part of their, their idea of their being so barbaric are things that we wouldn't perceive as barbaric. But the people who basically are giving these labels are, are sedentary societies. So... Again, you can sort of do, I'm sort of looking for you to sort of think about this in yourself. Um, and one of the things that I'm interested in looking at is in the, um, is when I'm looking at your discussion, this is your discussion sections, um, or your, not discussion sections, your forums, as when you'll be writing about this. And you could talk about it with each other. I've been really, really enjoying reading. I, I'm enjoying reading all your posts, but I've been really enjoying reading the posts that you write on, uh, that other people write. And sometimes there have been these really interesting discussions. Sometimes people challenge people about this. So I'm looking forward to seeing you having these discussions about what historical memory is in this. And again, we, I will be having a, a review session for you. Um, I'll kind of write about this. I'm going to set this up on Zoom um, next Thursday, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, May 7th um, at 9.30, the time of our normal class. I'll have a review session. This will be a good chance for you to actually be able to ask me questions um, more as a class. Okay, thank you very much and stay safe.